Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening for this evening's event. I'm Jeff Kempe. I'm a librarian with the King County Library System. Uh, before we get started, a little housekeeping. There are a couple of ways to participate in today's webcast. You can uh, use the chat to say hello. After the conversation, we will have some time for audience questions. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also vote other people's questions if you see a good one uh, that you'd like to hear answered. We're grateful to the KCLS Foundation for their support of tonight's event and our ongoing author series. Uh, to help support the Foundation in events like these, click the Donate button below. Uh, to learn more about upcoming events, um, upcoming author events specifically, uh, you can visit kcls.org forward slash author voices. Uh, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Braiding Sweetgrass, the link below will take you to our partner bookstore, Third Place Books. Uh, and now I am delighted to introduce tonight's speaker and moderator. Dr. Robin wall Kimmerer is a mother, scientist, decorated professor, and enrolled member of the Citizen Potawam Potawatomi Nation. She is the author, author of Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, which has earned Kimmerer wide acclaim. Her first book, Gathering Moss, A Natural and Cultural History of Mosses, was awarded the John Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing, and her other work has appeared in Orion, Whole Terrain, and numerous scientific journals. She tours widely and has been featured on NPR's On Being with Krista Tippett, and in 2015 addressed the General Assembly of the United Nations on the topic of healing our relationship with nature. Kimmerer is a uh, SUNY Distinguished Teaching Professor of Environmental Biology and the founder and director of the Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, whose mission is to create programs which draw on the wisdom of both indigenous and scientific knowledge for our shared goals of sustainability. Our moderator, uh, Dr. Charlotte Cote, has been teaching in American Indian Studies at the University of Washington since 2001. Dr. Cote holds a PhD and an MA in Comparative Ethnic Studies from the University of California at Berkeley, a BA in Political Science from Simon Fraser University in BC, and a Diploma in Broadcast Communications from the BC Institute of Technology. She is affiliated faculty in the UW's Jackson School Canadian Studies Center. Cote is the author of Spirits of Our Willing Ancestors, Revitalizing Maca and Nuchanal Traditions, which raises issues concerning indigenous self-determination, eco-colonialism, and food sovereignty. Um, her new book, A Drum in One Hand, A Sockeye in the Other, Stories of Indigenous Food Sovereignty from the Northwest Coast, it's coming out this year, combines food and indigenous study scholarship with personal memoir, stories, case studies, and indigenous language and philosophy to show how traditional foods play a major role in physical, emotional, spiritual, and dietary wellness. Thank you so much to both of you for being with us tonight. Um, as a reminder, you can purchase Braiding Sweetgrass from Third Place Books at the link below, as well as make a donation to the KCLS Foundation to support our author events. You can also borrow Braiding Sweet Glass from KCLS. I'll put a link in chat in just a moment here. I'm also going to be putting a link to a survey about tonight's event in chat. And please let us know what you think and if there are other authors you'd like to hear from in the future. Um, and look, look for upcoming events on our social media. And you can also go to kcls.org forward slash author voices. Uh, thanks again for being here and have a great night. Um, and uh, now I'm going to hand it over to our, our speaker and moderator. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, Tushwakma Tupshit Horsemen, good evening, everyone. Uklama Otis Mayot, Tisha Aksuma, Nuchanoha team. I'm sharing with you my language and telling you that my Kohis or indigenous name is Shotis or Shotis my alt. It means carrying thunder and it comes from my whaling heritage. 
I am Sishat, and we are part of the larger nation of New Channel on the west coast of Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. I want to acknowledge that I'm not in my homelands. I live in Seattle and work at the University of Washington. And I acknowledge where Seattle, as well as the university is, is it's situated on the ancestral homelands of the Duwamish peoples. And I acknowledge the lands and the shared waters of the Duwamish, the Suquamish, Muckleshoot, Puyallup, and Tulalip tribes, people recognized as Coast Salish. I am so happy to be here today. I am so excited to be sharing this Zoom space with Dr. Robin Kimmerer and um, that I finally get to meet you, even if it is in a Zoom box. I'm so yes. excited to be here alongside you today and I look forward to our conversation. I have read both your amazing books, Gathering Moss and Braiding Sweetgrass, and I use braiding sweetgrass in a lot of my classes um, and um, my students are, are overwhelmed with what they learn from, from this book. Um, I uh, love how you present the book as a uh, gift of braided stories uh, meant to heal our relationship with the world. And a lot of what I, what I took from the book and um, and personally, as well as in my research, it, it really and truly inspired and empowered me, especially in my relationship to the world around me, to the plants and animals and our waters and lands that uh, provide us sustenance. I want to begin with, uh, by reading part of a review for braiding, for braiding sweetgrass, and it says, as a botanist, Robin Wall Kimmerer has been trained to ask questions of nature with the tools of science. As a member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation, she embraces the notion that plants and animals are our oldest teachers. In Braiding Sweetgrass, Kimmerer brings these two lenses of knowledge together to take us on a journey that is every bit as mythic as it is scientific, as sacred as it is historical as clever as it is wise. So I, I want to ask you, can you share with us a little bit about your writing and your personal journey and as well as how Braiding Sweetgrass came to be? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for those, for sharing those, those words that really make me reflect on my own, on my own journey and my own work. Um, may I say also at the outset, um, Bonjour, Jayak. Uh, hello, everyone. Shabadaski Gij Kokwe Nadeshnakas, Budwe Wadmi Kwenda, Megazedo Dem, meanwhile, Makot, Megazedo Dem, meanwhile, Makoto Dem. I've told you that I'm a Potawatomi woman of the Bear Clan and also of, of the Eagles, and um, that my name is Light Shining Through Sky Woman. Um, which um, is has been a great guide for me in thinking about um, my work of illuminating the land below. Um, and that really, Charlotte, I feel is is my work is 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 to illuminate. Um, we are all together too often blind to the gifts that are around us. Um, and I think it creates a, a kind of a poverty. Um, that comes simply from not paying attention to our relatives, to our plant relatives, to water and, and, and to land. And so for me, I wanted the book to be like a field trip, a field trip that calls people to pay attention. Um, I know that, you know, you and I both are very interactive with our students. I suspect you love to teach on the land as well. And for me as a teacher, as a scientist, and absolutely as a writer, one of my favorite moments in in a day, or really in a life, are when you are with people and you say, look, look, and we all start looking at the same thing. We're not going to see the same thing. Um, but that moment of collective engagement, of looking at the world, is, is to me so exciting. And that's how I wanted to write Braiding Sweetgrass, was an invitation to look, 
to be on a field trip um, and and see what you see. And, and stories are such a great way to help people remember maybe what they see or or interpret what they see. But I take so much guidance from all of our, our elders who are always saying, you know, you're going to hear this story and what it means to you, I can't tell you. Um, and the, the, the meaning that that story has for you will change through your life. Um, and so it, the book is an invitation to look and to consider not to, to say what those teachers are saying to us, but for to open our imaginations that those plants are teaching us and, and what could we learn together? Mm, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to read um, a paragraph from your, from your book. Um, you write that um, on uh, page 115 of Braiding Sweetgrass, you, you write, we now turn our thoughts to the creator or great spirit and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on Mother Earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the creator. Now our minds are one. You write um, below that, um, before that, be below that blessing. These words, the words are simple, but in the art of their joining, they become a statement of sovereignty, a political structure, a bill of responsibilities. And then you go on to say, cultures of gratitude but must also be cultures of reciprocity. Can you share with us what you mean by that? Cultures of gratitude must also be cultures of reciprocity. Yes, yes. And I'm so glad that you chose that passage from the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address. Um, I live here in Haudenosaunee territory. And just this morning um, with our students, those words that come before all else were mm -hmm. invoked and fell down upon us. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, I'm glad to have them with us tonight. The Thanksgiving address is, of course, and other expressions of, of gratitude are a response to that attention to recognize the gifts of other beings, right, that keep us alive, mm -hmm. that we are all related and in this web of interdependence. And then I want to, we know that we are often told that our first responsibility as people is gratitude that flows from paying attention. But as human people, gratitude for me invokes this need to reciprocate. As I am grateful for receiving the gift of water, I feel like having received that gift, I am in your debt and I want to pay you back in a way with my own gift. To me, it's a very human response. When someone gives us something, we want to give something in return. It is a kind of justice making, isn't it? Balance making um, of this give and take. And so when I talk about cultures of gratitude are also cultures of reciprocity, it is this idea that when we are given the gift from our more than human relatives, that it call, there's a call and response there, that we have to give our gift in order for the gifts of the relatives to continue to flow. And this is a place where my thinking as a, as a spiritual person and my training as a plant ecologist converge because mm -hmm. in ecological law, the law of the land, reciprocity is essential. No living system can ever persist if it's all one way. Um, everything mm -hmm. must be replenished. Everything moves in a circle. And contemporary humans have somehow adopted this notion that we're exempt from natural law. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the coupling of gratitude and reciprocity is to remind us that we are not um, 
uh, immune. We, the, the laws of thermodynamics have not been repealed on our behalf. And not only that we must reciprocate to keep systems going, but that there's joy in that reciprocity. Joy mm -hmm. in knowing that just like we give thanks, you know, to the to the plants for taking care of us, to the fish for taking care of us, mm -hmm. that they might be joyful that we were taking care of them. And that kind of joyful reciprocity is so missing from so many of our lives. We think of ourselves as just takers, that we're just consumers. In fact, it feels like in public discourse, we're hardly even called citizens anymore. We're consumers. And and that coupling of gratitude and reciprocity reminds us that we're givers, gift givers as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think, and just in, in thinking about that and what you're saying, and I, um, I didn't write it down, but there you have um, also, um, and, and I have it in my book, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. But you talk about you that um, getting your food from the stores, and you you mention um, package. I think it's a chicken that it's packaged. That you know, we it's hard to see it as a gift. And you say it's not a gift; it's a theft because we're not really experiencing that reciprocity. Because many people will really? go into the store and really not think about the life that is being given to them in order for them to eat, to take that food, regardless if it is chicken or it is beef, or if it is a carrot, or if it is some kind of vegetable that we just take it home and we eat it, that, that, that somehow that, that connection, that reciprocal relationship that we have has been broken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Beautifully said. And it's, it's in a way the, um, the triumph of the colonial view, right? Of seeing all the other beings as commodities, mm -hmm. as natural resources that mm -hmm. they're not, you know, in, in our vision, there are relatives, right? Yeah. Um, but in the, in market capitalism, they're stuff, they're objects, they're, they're commodities. So we mm -hmm. don't see the life. We just think it's as, as if it came from a factory as mm -hmm. opposed to being the lives of other beings. Um, we've yeah. really lost our way. Um, yeah, yeah. And, exactly. I, and I, I don't want to say lost our way. We have mm -hmm. been made to lose our way mm -hmm. um, for ulterior motives of, 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 mm -hmm. uh, of the economy. And I think that kind of leads into my next question and how you just ended that. In your chapter, Putting Down the Roots, you write, losing a plant can threaten a culture in much the same way as losing a language. Can you share with us what you mean? Oh, yeah. Hmm. What comes to mind immediately is cultural keystone species. Those species of plants, in this case, who are so important in life ways, as medicines, as, as materials, as teachers, as for, for art, for language, that these beings are integral to our lives and our identity. And one of the examples that comes to mind is Wiskok, the, the black ash, for example, a, such an important basketry plant for, for Anishinaabe peoples and Haudenosaunee as, Haudenosaunee as well, and our Wabanaki relatives, wherever that plant grows, it's integrated into indigenous cultures and, and life ways. I think about the families of Potawatomi basket makers who for seven generations, those families have been basket makers, tending the woods and the way that they harvest actually helps the black ash to grow back. So the black ash takes care of them. They take care of the black ash. The they learn and use the language while they're caring for that plant and making the baskets. Um, they're teaching. Um, what happens when there's no more black ash? How is it that one's intergenerational identity, one's sense of place and connection to a piece of land, all of those things are, are interrupted when that plant goes. And 
And I choose black ash, not only because it's culturally so important for our people, but because it is the favorite food of an invasive insect, the emerald ash borer, that mm. is threatening the existence of those ashes. And when we say, well, invasive species take a toll on biodiversity, yes, they do. They also take a toll on cultural diversity um, mm. and in cultural continuity. And um, so that's what I mean, that, mm. that when a plant is, is, is lost, its teachings, its ways, the way we talk about it, the songs that might go with it, they, they have no container anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I think about that with respect to, um, you know, what has happened to us and our language as Indigenous peoples and what federal policy has done to our language, the th how our language is threatened today because of boarding schools, for example, and our children, our, our, our relatives, our, the people who came before us, how they were beaten for, for just trying to keep our cultures alive while they were there as, as young children. And it made me think about that, you know, the loss and what that's done and how we're working so hard to regain our languages again. And it's something that I've been really focused on. And I think maybe the one positive outcome of COVID is that I was able to take um, online classes. I, grew, I was born and raised with my language, but never ever learned it fluently. And I was able to take our language uh, over the last couple of years while we've been in, you know, basic lockdown. And it's been one of the, one of the joys in just not only myself becoming more fluent, but watching all of the young people in my new channel com communities uh, learning beautiful. as well. It's beautiful. Been yeah. The next question I have for you focuses on food sovereignty. In 2007, La Via Campesina, which is an organization of, uh, of global um, indigenous peoples, peasants, small peasant farmers, they created a concept called food sovereignty that challenged the global food regime. And food sovereignty the way it what became defined is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food systems and their food and agricultural systems. Since then, indigenous peoples worldwide began using food sovereignty as a framework to address their own food needs. For indigenous peoples, food sovereignty is the right to eat our cultural and healthy foods, to define our own food systems, to have access to our traditional or ancestral territories, to harvest them, which is fundamental to our health and our cultural survival. So indigenizing the food sovereignty movement really moves it beyond it being just a rights-based discourse and moves more to emphasizing cultural responsibilities and relationships that we as indigenous peoples have with, with our environment. What are your thoughts on the food sovereignty movement and how can we indigenous peoples protect our food systems when our homelands and our waterways are continually being threatened by extractive industries, by climate change, by environmental degradation? What are your thoughts? very much aligned with what you have have outlined that food the food sovereignty movement which has been so important in language revitalization in in access to land in particular in seed saving in mm -hmm. intergenerational knowledge transfer in healing our relationship to place through food it it's been it's been a marvel to to watch um and a marvel to have on our plates, um, mm -hmm. uh, the delicious foods that when when we eat our ancestral foods, you know, there's that, you just feel like, oh, now that's food. That's mm -hmm. what my body has been wanting, that my spirit has been wanting. Um, and so it feeds identity as well, both indigenous, individual and, and, and collective identity. Mm -hmm. And there's so many threats 
to it. I mean, you, you've named some of them when we think about um, contamination of, of, of water, um, fossil fuel development that, that simply degrades our, our, our lands, all of the above for, for agricultural production, but also for foraging and, and gathering from, from the woods. When we make maple syrup, you know, we want to be, it, we, ha we have to do that in a place where the water is clean, right? Mm -hmm. um, we also have to do that with plants who are exquisitely sensitive to disruptions in climate. Um, mm -hmm. One of our first foods is, 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 is maple. And when I look at the climate models and realize that, that for us, the, you know, the leader of the trees, the maple, is going to become a climate refugee. Um, um, by the time that my grandchildren might um, tap trees. And that breaks my heart. Um, the threats are from the outside at a time when our people are coming together and revitalizing our knowledge to have it being impacted from outside is a, is a powerful kind of, of environmental injustice. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't even touched upon, you know, genetic contamination of of our plants as well. I grow some of our heritage varieties of corn, and in the rural community that I live in, there are lots of other corn growers around me, and um, I try to grow as far away as I can from 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 my neighbors. But just the notion that there is genetically modified pollen in the air that's interacting with the, the corn that our ancestors carried on the Great Migration a thousand years ago, um, that's really painful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so much that we can say about genetically modified foods and, uh, you know, and the, the how, how we, um, you know, we, we see these foods. I mean, and I'm thinking about this, they call it the frankenfish this modified salmon that, that yeah. they're making in, in tanks out mm -hmm. of the water. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and what does that do to, uh, to our foods themselves that they're being changed, they're being transformed, they're being um, destroyed in that way by completely mm -hmm. alterating what they were. Um, you know, that, that, that makes me more nervous than just thinking about, you know, the changes in the nutri nutritional um, um, aspect of, of that food, um, is, you know, what else the spirits of those, those foods are also yeah. changing as they're being yes. transformed and, and changed, um, genetically, um, two here in the North, to, Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, no, it's okay. no, I just want to say to, to your point about this being a responsibility based movement, um, mm -hmm. that it isn't only a rights to, healthy salmon it is our responsibility for salmon that they live in a good way yeah exactly so yeah I and, and i was just going to mention here in the northwest coast you mentioned the maple and the, the shifts that you're seeing and the changes to the maple the, your maple relative we're seeing that with our salmon relatives here in the northwest coast with the continual warming of the waters with ocean acidification and our people, my people um, uh, have, a, that's a sacred relationship that we have to salmon. And if the salmon go away, that takes a part of us away too. We lose a part of us if we lose that salmon. And it's something that's so critical for not just as a nutritional food source, but also for a spiritual, for our spiritual sustenance. And so we really, um, in the last couple of years, have really noticed that. And especially this last year, when we went through a major heat spell here in the Northwest Coast that we've never seen before. Yeah. You know, it, it's really in many ways. I mean, I, I hope that our conversation will give people hope. <laughs> the hope, <laughs> and that that will will leave on that rather than you know, um, bringing out all of what has you know what is shifted in our world and um you know all of these things that have have been destroyed as a result i think we still can see hope the threads of hope with it within that yeah and i wanted to and in, in in my next question 
I wanted to focus on traditional ecological knowledge and science. And this last Monday, President Joe Biden pledged during the opening of the White House Tribal Nation Summit to work with tribes to incorporate tribal ecological knowledge into the federal government's scientific approach to fighting uh, climate change. This is the first time a presidential administration has committed to incorporating traditional indigenous knowledge into the science, technical, social, and econo economic advancement of the United States. As an indigenous scholar and scientist, what are your thoughts on this and how can indigenous peoples engage in programs and policy that introduce traditional ecological knowledge to the Western scientific community in a way that respect, respects and protects our knowledge? Yeah. Well, first, let me share with you my amazement at those words. When, when you know, I saw federal policy and elevating traditional ecological knowledge in, in, in federal science and land management, I'd never thought I would see those words all in the same sentence. Um, it's, it's, it's revolutionary. And it built for the government, <laughs> for the federal <laughs> government. Um, and it builds on decades of this work by indigenous scientists and, and scholars to gain visibility for indigenous science um, and for the, the valid empirical solidity of, of our science, the science that helped us adapt to every um, change, every climate change of the past, right? That helped us live really good lives in sustainable ways. Um, our people have always been scientists. And for the most part, Western science, until not so long ago, dismissed it all as folklore and and mm -hmm. and, and legend and um, to, to and and contributed to its erasure. And what we're seeing is that there are, are example after example, long before President Biden's announcement, that Western science is catching up to indigenous science in terms of understanding the role of human people as um, playing a, a, an important caregiving role and a stewardship role as an active participant in the generation and maintenance of biodiversity. And um, there's a, a whole generation of, of, of indigenous scientists who have contributed to that um, scholarship and, and, and that awareness. And um, I, I feel really grateful for that our students are coming up in a time when trying to, um, we no longer have to combat the erasure, the, these notions of two-eyed seeing, of, of, of using both Western science, selected tools of Western science and the indigenous worldview and observations are such a powerful combination mm -hmm. that we need in this moment. I, you, Put me on my soapbox here, Charlotte. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's it's an exciting it's an exciting time. But to the other part point part of your question, is in the enthusiasm that Western scientists may be beginning to have in recognizing the power and um, uh, capacity of indigenous science is get, given the power differential between Western science and, and indigenous science, the potentials for, um, for appropriating and misusing that knowledge are very real. And so at least in my own work and my own teaching, I try to combat that by first teaching responsibility for knowledge. You know, in the Western way of thinking, knowledge for knowledge's sake is a high is a is a good that is understood as a good. Um, but in in many of our people's ways, knowledge is coupled to responsibility, and so we have to have ethical responsibility for that knowledge before that knowledge is shared. Um, so that's sort of the caveat um, that our work as scholars is not only to illuminate native knowledge, 
but also to protect it. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That really, uh, I think, fits right into my next question. How can we, as a global community, change our perspective of Mother Earth? Or, you know, I'm just thinking, looking at throughout the world, how can we change our perspective of Mother Earth and look at her and all she provides to us as what you call gifts, as gifts to us, and not view her as a commodity. So what actions can we all take in restoring our environment and healing our relationship with the world? Yeah. I'm glad that you focus on that particular lever, in a sense, for social and cultural change. And it's in the words that you use. We call her Mother Earth, right? Um, the notion of the Earth as our relative, as our, as our mother who, we, who cares for us and we care for her in that deeply emotional, bonded way is just at the heart. But the way that most Western folks are raised and educated and enmeshed in, in an economy that demands that Mother Earth not be a person, that, that it be a, a warehouse full of commodities, um, is, is frightening. But at the same time, I feel that that's where the power lever is because I can't topple the fossil fuel industry. I'm not going to dismantle extractive capitalism, but I and you, everybody can choose how they view the earth. You know, am I going to treat the earth as if it's a, a shopping bag or am I going to understand that this is mother earth, that it's not just that she provides for us, and I write about this in Braiding Sweetgrass, but that we, the way that she provides for us, not only materially, but in teaching us and, and spiritually is, is the way a mother cares for her children. And when we come to realize that we could say, well, we love the land. And when you recognize that the land loves you back, that changes everything. It changes everything. And that, I think, is the power of story. That's the power of art to shift people's minds to say, what you call natural resources, I'm going to call a gift. Um, what, what, what you call an, you know, property, I'm going to call my mother. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's a change in heart. And I think it's art and story that do that work. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It, it makes me, um, yeah, it, it, it makes me think about that language, the use of language. And I, I try to do this in my classes where I'm very conscious of when I do talk about the plants and animals and not using those words, because I think the words, as you mentioned, the words we use will generate that respect. I mean, if we just continually see um, uh, food is something you get from the grocery store rather than food as something that it's giving its life to you, that you will start changing that relationship to it. And it sometimes it just seems so that that we we can't make that change. But I think even those small, those, those, those small, what we'd say are steps to just creating a different connection to the world around you and what you just said really fits into um oh yeah we've got a few minutes so it really fits into how i wanted to um end the um our discussion and move into the q a um there's so many so many um sections of this book that i love that i absolutely love um what really resonated with me was your um, your your section on um, the when you visited Portland and you were talking about the rain and it's the let's see if I have the oh witness the rain it's from the the what I want to read is from your chapter which 
here, I don't know if you know, in the Northwest Coast, I feel like I need to build an arc within Abbey so much from here. Yeah. I mean, yeah. In the last couple of days, it's been very concerning because um, yeah. we have been seeing floods that we haven't seen yeah. in years like this before. And it's like, what do we do? So rain, I know rain. And I, you know, being raised in a Northwest coast, I I understand the significance of rain, but I, I love this and of all, I love the poetry of your words and the way you express these very important concepts to us within that poetic language. And you talk about, and I'm, I, it's going to be a quote about this drop of water. And I want to read it because I remember when I was reading this, I was outside, sitting outside. It was a warm, sunny day. And I was reading that, uh, that chapter. And um, it made me think about my relationship to rain and to not be annoyed when I get caught in the rain. It makes my hair go fuzzy. <laughs> that's what, what you were talking about. I thought, okay, all I can think about when I'm walking in the rain, I'm going to have fuzzy hair when I leave. <laughs> so I, I, want to, I want to share this uh, with everyone. And you write, I can see my face reflected in a dangling drop. The fisheye lens gives me a giant forehead and tiny ears. I suppose that's the way we humans are, thinking too much and listening too little. Paying attention acknowledges that we have something to learn from the intelligent intelligences others other than our own. Listening, standing witness, creating an openness to the world in which the boundaries between us can dissolve in a raindrop. The drop swells on the tip of a cedar and I catch it on my tongue like a blessing. I'm almost getting puddly eyed reading that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love it. I'm sure many of you who are here today joining us are from the, the Northwest Coast and you that resonates with you. It just hits me here that to next time, I'm out that I can experience you know, that my, my, the beauty of, of the rain in that way as, as, this, as this beautiful gift. And so I really want to ask, and as we close this section um, and move into the Q&A, do you have anything you would like to share with us to end this conversation? I would like to pick up the thread that you just created, and that thread is beauty. Mm. And the beauty of language means a lot to me as you're observing. And to me, I feel like it's a mirror of the beauty of the world. Um, if we only stop and pay attention. And I think it is that eye for the beauty of the world that creates the window into transformation. Um, mm. And, and so that I think is, is, is a kind of medicine um, to really embrace the beauty of, of the world. And that's one of the reasons it was so important to me to have the language of braiding sweetgrass be so beautiful that you can't help but fall in love with the world. Mm -hmm. So much of our environmental discourse is fear-based. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have to act because bad things are going to happen if we don't. And that's true. Mm -hmm. But we also can act out of love for the world that is conveyed through our appreciation for its beauty. And I think that that's the next development. And I think we're seeing it already in the environmental movement is that it is the ignition of our love for the world that is that is transformative. Yeah, transformative, I love that, definitely. I have really enjoyed this time with you. It has just been more, giving me more wonderful energy and fuel to continue to to um, uh, um, 
create, try to be a part of creating this change that we need to build on that reciprocity that we need to see in our in our communities and to be able to us to all come together as a larger global society and understand the importance of viewing our earth as mother yeah. and for us to all share in her as a gift and to respect that and to show as you say that that um, gratitude through these gifts of reciprocity and it just really i really hope everyone here today that is that joined us <clears throat> can really feel that and feel the way i'm feeling i really really enjoyed this talk and thank you for sharing i feel like i have now been given a gift <laughs> yeah. i raise my hands to you and thanks and appreciation Paco, 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 thank you. To Miigwech for a beautiful conversation mm -hmm. and for all of your amazing work and, and, and your new book, which is a gift mm -hmm. as well. So, wow. Miigwech. Thank Paco, thank you. So we have um, some questions in the um, ask a question at the bottom of the screen. Um, Do you want to read those, Dr. Cote, or would you like me to read those off? Oh, that's, oh, I was wondering where they were. Um, I can, I can go ahead okay. and read them. It's right at the bottom where it says, ask a question. Bottom. Is the first one, okay, it says Miigwech, is that yes, the first and, the, and they're ranked by the number of votes that they've been given um, by um, uh, other oh. folks in the talk, so. Oh, okay. I see. Okay, the first question is, miigwech for speaking with us today, Dr. Kimmerer. I am an Anishinaabe master's student in marine and environmental affairs and American Indian studies at UW. I am working on a project to decolonize and indigenize the UW's College of the Environment to amplify indigenous perspectives within our program. Could you speak on pathways to decolonization decolonization, I think that means pathways to decolonizing academia and its importance for environmental studies. Chi Miigwech. Well, first of all, thank you for doing that work, um, for engaging in the these, these ongoing steps of decolonization. And I'm in an um, ecology of the environment as, as well. And I know how challenging that can be in a um, in institutions that are so steeped in in Western scientific worldviews. And the place that seems important to me, and where my students and I are trying to focus some of our our, our energy within the, within the university, is to be sure that the presence of indigenous thought is within our disciplines. Um, so often it seems to me that that um, cultural perspectives are outside of the sciences and our science colleagues can say, oh, well, that's happening over in another department. We don't need to be thinking about this. Um, and I think the incorporation of indigenous science into Western sciences, when we're, when we're studying marine biology, when we're studying forest ecology, we should be bringing into it um, land-based pedagogy um, mm -hmm. and, and the knowledge of, 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 our, of our people. And um, so bringing these ideas into the sciences is, I think, really um, essential. And it can be done as, as simply as um, the changing the examples that we use. Um, I think about having been a, when I was an undergraduate in a forest ecology class, Potawatomi woman sitting in this class, and the professor came in and said, oh, we're so excited to announce that Western scientists have discovered that fire is good for the land. I'm like, really? <laughs> <laughs> You're discovering that, huh? Um, um, so that invisibility of, of indigenous knowledge um, can be reversed by, if you're going to talk about fire ecology, talk about indigenous science as, as the, as the 
um, revealers of, of that whole branch of science. Mm -hmm. So I agree. that's a perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I'm glad I, I'm, I'm going to read the next question and I'm glad this question came forward because I did have, this was one of my questions, but I wasn't able to get to it about COP26, COP26, the mm -hmm. climate change co conference. Um, the question is, can Dr. Kimmer share any reflections about COP or COP26? Um, how do we advance the values of the book into the mainstream climate and justice movements that speak to the spiritual and reciprocal relationships to the land and move away and beyond market energy innovations, false yeah. solutions to instead move to real indigenous values of the honorable harvest, economic justice, and restore our relationships to the land on a broad and urgent scale. That's a very long question, <laughs> but a very important one. It's a very important question. And my take on, on, on COP26 is probably very like your own. You know, in one hand, holding tremendous disappointment, tremendous mm -hmm. disappointment at the lack of, of truly effective action with the kind of urgency that is, is needed. And that is absolutely true. We, we, it's inexcusable. Um, on the other hand, there's also, I think about all of the artists, the indigenous activists, the climate justice movement, which was so present in Glasgow. Um, voices, I'm guessing like your own, who are going to say, this is unacceptable. No, this is not nearly enough. We can't keep having business as usual. Um, it, it has to be anything, but we need a revolution in the way that we think about our relationship to the earth. Um, and we can say that like, oh, well, we, we need to do this, but this is existential, right? Um, when I hear that, oh, we can't do that because it costs too much. It costs too much to save life on earth? It, that just does not compute for me. Um, yeah. and, and, and it is that kind of urgency that, 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 that people are demanding. We, we, we just have to keep going. Um, we have to keep going because we know how to solve the climate crisis. We have the technology and I dare say we have the money. We're not willing to spend it. We're not willing to make those investments um, because mm -hmm. we are still so um, grounded in the Western extractive worldview um, mm -hmm. that privileges human economic well-being over the well-being of every other being on the planet. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's that is morally and ecologically bankrupt. Yeah, yeah. And it really is in thinking about <clears throat> the the um, uh, conference that just took place that it was the first time that we saw such a large indigenous representation there. Um, the um, indigenous peoples represented the second largest civil society delegation in attendance and second only to the oil and gas lobbyists who were also there. Um, I didn't know that. That's stunning. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty pretty amazing. And the uh, Indian NDN Collective and Indigenous Climate Action Organizations put out a statement about it, and that you know that that they were they were happy that there was a lot of representation. They were really you know that really showed that there there is a need for that to have Indigenous voices, but that it really in many ways they saw it as falling flat because they really, you can give a space, but you need to give a voice for that in that space as well. And they didn't see that happen. But, you know, every year we just need to keep moving forward and make sure our voices are being heard. And I think that's, you know, with what is happening under President Biden, I think this is a real good step in that direction. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, the next question, do you have a book recommendation for fans of braiding sweetgrass that are interested, that are interested in reading more from other Indigenous scholars? Hmm. I'm thinking, 
there's so many choices. You know, I would I would point people to um, maybe it's because I was just on a panel with Dan the other day. Dan Wildcat's um, mm -hmm. writing I just mm -hmm. love. His book um, Red Alert um, is 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 a classic um, and really makes the case for the um, essentiality of indigenous knowledge in addressing both so social and ecological issues that we face today. Mm -hmm. um, I would also, it, it's, it's not solely indigenous authors, um, but from the Center for Humans and Nature, um, there's a, a new volume that I was privileged to help ed, co-edit um, about kinship and and we were we, it features many indigenous authors on the subject of our kinship in this this culture of gratitude and respons responsibility and reciprocity so that might be a a good place to be introduced to a a, a variety of 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 voices and what was the name of the, the book it's called kinship oh, it's called kinship okay yeah yeah. And it's the book that you edited? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So if 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 you caught that, um, kinship. Um, and who is the other editor that you mentioned? You co-edited it? Gavin Van Horn and John Hausdorfer. And it comes from the Center for Humans and Nature. Um, oh wonderful. I should I probably have one right here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see someone has posted a link. There we go. Wonderful. Yes. Beautiful. The, Kinship, belonging in a world of relations. Yep. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Thank you. I'm going to have to get that book. Sounds wonderful. The next, oh, I guess we, yes, we still have time. I think we're finishing at 8.30. Okay. We can probably get at least one more question in. In braiding sweetgrass, you refer to our need as people to connect with nature and to not support damaging agricultural business. However, in today's world, many don't have land to start a garden or money to buy respectively harvested foods. Where do we start and how do we not get discouraged? Yeah, that's, a, that's such an important question. When we don't, when our choices are so limited by economic inequality essentially um, mm -hmm. and one of the ways that I try to think about that when we how do we how do we support our food system how do we support regenerative agriculture when we can't do it ourselves or in many cases afford the the organic produce that's coming from those beautiful sustainable farms and to me, the way that we have to do that is through collective action and political pressure. Um, mm -hmm. If we can't do it through having our hands in the earth or using our currency of, of, um, of currency of the dollar, I think we do it with our voices, um, with the with the demands that we make, and always keeping in mind in our in our activism in our conversations with others that healthy food is a right um, and that we can't have healthy food without healthy land. Um, it, it, to me, it is a, a coupling of, of, of land rights, land justice and, and, and public health justice. Um, so I think that our tools become system change um, as well as, as, as personal change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really agree. Um, Jeffrey, do we have time for one more? I think this this question is really fitting to. Wonderful, yeah, yes. Yeah, if I can quickly ask this question that's posted. I teach science at Heritage High School in Tulalip, Washington. We have many indigenous students in our school. I'll be sharing this video with my students next week before our four days off. How can I talk about Thanksgiving with my students before our four days off? Mm. <laughs> You're just calling up all those problematic images around Thanksgiving. Um, 
you know, one of the ways that aside telling the truth about the Thanksgiving holiday is a great place to start. Um, but I think what is most important is to cultivate a sense of real gratitude among our uh, among young people. Um, the notion that um, Thanksgiving has become a time for so much consumption. The one day a year that Western society sets apart to speak of gratitude has become a day of, of tremendous consumption. And to hold back on that, to say, let's really focus on what is it that sustains our lives and, and do that work with, with young people and what, and lead them, right? If, if we need to, well, where, what, why do you have food on your table on, on Thanksgiving? Because of the gifts of the earth, because of the gifts of farmers, because of the gifts of seeds and of, of, of animals. And then to say, what do we, what do we owe them? Do we more than, than um, celebrating them? Um, how do we care for them as well? To couple gift and reciprocity through the means of cultivating gratitude. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with your students. Thank you. I agree. That was a very fitting way to 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 end the um, the evening. Thank you, Dr. Kimmer. Thank you, Dr. Cote, and. Um, Thanks to everyone who joined us this evening. Again, if you have a chance to fill out the survey uh, to give us an idea of other authors uh, you'd, you'd like uh, us to have in future series, please let us know. Have a wonderful evening. And mm. uh, again, thank you for joining us and thank you both. Mm. Thank you so much. That was a delight, yeah. It was wonderful. Click go, thank you.